All right, good deal. We'll see if we can get this thing showing proper. All right, so we've got some considerations for uh, spring management. Um, anytime that we're dealing with a pond, it's just like any other ecosystem. There's, there's gonna be things that are in constant fluctuation and change. And as pond owners and pond managers, it's up to us to try and keep this stuff in balance. Um, either just to provide the aesthetics that we want to have a pretty and pristine pond, or if we're looking to try to manage it for, uh, for sport fishing and recreational fishing, there's quite a bit of management that can go into that as well. Um, today, I'm actually down here at the Spring Hill Experiment Station. Um, we were actually out testing some new equipment on a pond earlier. Got to see a lot of what was going on with that, getting to see water temperatures warm up a little bit, which will come into play with some of our management roles. Um, and we'll get into that in a moment. Now, I promise I'll try to keep this presentation under two hours in length. Like I said, I tend to get a little excited with this kind of stuff, so uh, we'll try not to go overboard. So the first thing that we want to talk about, Matt mentioned that he's been getting quite a few calls on weed control, uh, different issues with algae and pond grasses popping up, and that's to be expected this time of year. Days are getting longer, we're getting more sunlight. That's allowing a lot more time for these plants to photosynthesize and to grow and reproduce and become somewhat of a problem. Uh, I've been seeing lots and lots of ponds just driving by, even including the one I was on this morning, that are dealing with quite a bit of filamentous algae. Um, and that stuff, it grows rapidly. It's just that snotty, slimy pond scum that we see oftentimes in the shallow portions of the pond around the edge. Uh, so for controlling that, as well as controlling other weeds, prevention is gonna be a very, very key, it is gonna play a key role in this, um, as well as identifying our weeds. We've got, we, there's, there's hundreds of different weeds that you can have growing in your pond and without being able to identify those we can't really recommend how to control them. So we'll get into how to do all of that effectively as well. So as we mentioned uh, weed control is going to be dependent on identifying that plant and knowing what growth stage that that weed is in. So you've got two really handy resources in your toolbox. The first one being your county extension agent. Um, we're very fortunate. The University of Tennessee's got agents in all 95 counties, and most everybody, most all of your agents have got a pretty decent handle on uh, on a lot of these pond weeds, or at the very least, a lot of the more common ones. Um, and if your extension agent is unavailable, or, or if they are unable to assist. Uh, you've also got the aqua plant website through Texas A&M University. This is a fantastic tool. I use it regularly myself to help me identify different weeds that I might not be quite as familiar with. And it also usually provides a control, um, a, a control recommendation for those weeds. So staying on this topic of identifying these weeds effectively, um, getting this information to your agent uh, allows them to get the information to me if they need to. Um, and oftentimes folks will photograph these and email them or text them to their agent. So whenever you're photographing a weed for identification, make sure to take several photos. Try to get up close shots of the leaves, stems, flowers, um, and then make note of how that weed is growing in or around your pond. We've got four basic growth uh, ways of growth that we can identify on these weeds and that's going to be emergent, submerged weeds, floating weeds, and then algae or plankton. And we can get a little bit off into the weeds on these because it, it can sometimes be a little bit difficult to determine an emergent weed versus a submerged weed and that's why we've got some pictures here that should hopefully help us to be able to better identify. So this is a fine example of an emergent weed. Um, the weed that we have in this picture right here is called spatter dock or cow lily. Um, oftentimes, whenever I get calls from folks, they'll say they've got lily pads. But the fact of the matter is, we've got several different types of lily pads that all have different types of growth cycles and as well as different types of control. So this is gonna be considered an emergent weed. Um, this is something that is rooted in the pond but it's gonna be growing and it's gonna be standing above the surface of the water. So it's rooted in the pond coming up, it's standing above the surface. Good examples are gonna be cattails, cow lilies, um, swamp grass or bulrush. We're gonna be considering that an emergent weed uh, because it's up above the water level. Um, the next kind that we have is a submerged weed. So we've got uh, these weeds 
90% of that weed is going to be underwater. This is the kind of stuff that when you look across your pond, you may not know that it's there, but whenever you run through it with a boat, with an outboard motor, you're certainly going to know it's there because it's going to wrap around your prop like wrapping spaghetti around a, around a fork, really. So these are also rooted weeds. They're rooted at the bottom of the pond, but most of their vegetative mass is below the water surface. So these are things like pond weed, naiad, hydrilla, etc. But being able to determine if it's a submerged weed is also going to help your agent or myself to identify it along with those photos. Our next one is going to be a floating type weed. Uh, true floating plants are not at all attached to the bottom. These are just floating on the water surface. Um, they're very in sizes. Uh, you can have stuff like what we see here. This is duckweed. Um, this stuff will clump up and grow on top of your pond and it can cover the entire surface of your pond and make it look like a putting green. Um, oftentimes this stuff will be confused with algae. It's actually not an algae. It's just a very small floating weed. And it's, it's the control method for this is completely different from what we would do for an algae control. Um, and then there are other weeds that we can see uh, can get up to a foot in diameter like water hyacinth. It's a very, very large floating weed, but it's not actually attached to the bottom of your pond. So making sure to determine is it in fact a floating weed or is it in fact something else like perhaps an algae. So this is something that Matt said that we've been seeing quite a bit of in, in Middle Tennessee. I've been getting quite a few calls about it in West Tennessee as well. Um, algae right now is really going at it. And the problem that we get into with algae is, is that it can, it can be a beneficial thing to have in your pond. We want to have planktonic algae. So these are gonna be um, little microscopic plants, basically your, your phytoplankton that grow in your pond. They, help do, they do help produce some oxygen and they are the base food source for the food chain. So your little micro, microbacteria and microfauna are going to be eating this and going up feeding your bluegill, which will in turn feed your bass and other sport fish. Uh, so the, the phytoplanktonic algae is actually can be beneficial, but if we get too much of it, like we see in this uh, picture over here on the right, that can be a problem. Other types of algae that we get into are going to be uh, filamentous algae, which we'll see more of in just a moment. Um, and then we also have blue-green algae, which is actually a toxic algae. Um, it was in the news just a few years back that there were a few dogs that actually got into some blue-green algae and wound up killing the dog. So this can be a very detrimental algae down here, the blue-green. Uh, but most of what we wind up seeing is going to be filamentous algae. Now with filamentous, um, this stuff is extremely common in shallow ponds and clear water. Um, these pictures were sent to me by a lady in Hickman County back in February, uh, back before we got all the snow. She was already having this stuff growing in her pond. But if we really look at these photos, the things that we'll notice is even though the pond has got a little bit of a blue coloration to it, the water is extremely clear and it's also extremely shallow. So that's allowing the sunlight to penetrate all the way to the bottom of this pond and causing that stuff to grow and reproduce. Um, so that's one of the first things that we would look at early in the year. We're already too late for it now, especially once we get to this stage. But early in the year, we can prevent some of this uh, by using a pond dye, which we'll discuss a little bit more in a moment. So with filamentous algae, which is most of what we've been seeing, prevention is going to be our first step. So this oftentimes becomes an issue in ponds with high nutrient loads. Um, if you've got a pond like the one here at Spring Hill, it's adjacent to a livestock paddock. Uh, a lot of that livestock manure may be washing off into the pond and causing a nutrient loading effect, which fertilizes that algae and causes it to grow really well. Uh, so in a situation like this, whether it's uh, fertilizer from an ag field or coming off of your lawn, you may look at planting a buffer strip of thick grass, allow it to get taller than what you would for your most of your lawn but allow a buffer strip to kind of catch and absorb some of that uh, fertilizer and nutrients before it ever reaches uh, your, your watershed there. Um, another thing that we can do is going to be to use a pond dye. Now this is something that we're going to look at probably in late January, early February, uh, but pond dye such as aqua shade, clear blue, um, that's something that we can add into that pond that is going to provide a barrier from that sunlight reaching the bottom of the pond where this stuff is growing at. 
Um, the really the best way to go about this is to have a pond that's got edges at least two feet deep. I know that's not necessarily possible with, with all of our ponds. A lot of our older ponds especially have these sloping edges that are fairly gradual. Um, and, and, and with something like that, the best thing we can do would be to bring in an excavator to try and deepen those edges to at least two feet to prevent that water, or excuse me, to prevent the sunlight from reaching to the bottom of, of the, uh, the water and causing that stuff to grow. Um, but if we can't do that, we can still go back to using aqua shade uh, to help shade that stuff out. Once we've got it growing at a rate like what we see here in this Hickman County photo, um, we're way past the point of prevention there. We're gonna move into something different. We're gonna be looking at treating it. Um, our best treatment for filamentous algae and our other algae and, and uh, planktonic species is gonna be your copper complexes. Um, so copper sulfate, copper chelate, they do a fantastic job controlling this stuff. However, they are toxic to fish. Um, so that's why we have to be very, very careful whenever we apply this stuff uh, to kill out the filamentous algae. Now we have several different um, aquatic mixtures of this that are commercially available, specifically designed for use in ponds, including in use, use in ponds that have fish present. Um, one example would be Qtrine Plus Granular. Um, it's a very, very easy way to, to, to apply this particular herbicide. Um, it's already granulated, so you can go along the edges of your pond and broadcast it out. Um, the tricky thing that we're going to get into on something like that is um, if we have a high infestation of this algae, we're not going to want to treat all of it at once because the issue you get into there, you're going to be loading your pond with too much copper all at once potentially. And also as this stuff dies, you've got microbacteria that are breaking it down and these microbes are using the dissolved oxygen in the water and your fish require that oxygen for survival. So if we're breaking down too much dissolved oxygen all at once, then it can cause a pond turnover simply due to the fact that we have too much dead material in the pond, the macro uh, activity is using up the oxygen and the fish wind up dying, not as a result of copper, but result of uh, depleted oxygen. So I mentioned that to mention that it's always very important to read and follow the label. This is an example of uh, a label for aqua shade. This is one of the pond dyes that's readily available. Um, usually whenever I recommend this to someone, they ask, well, how much do I need to put in your pond? At which point I give them the very, very common and handy extension answer. Well, it depends. Each pond is gonna be a little bit different. First thing that we need to do is to calculate uh, the cubic feet or cubic acreage of our ponds. Um, and the way that I like to do that, you can go on to the uh, Tennessee Property Data website. Uh, you can pull up your property map. You can go to um, the aerial view to where you can actually see the, your pond from a satellite. And then you can map that out and it will give you a breakdown either in square feet or in uh, square acres. Um, so we're going to be looking at that and we're going to be figuring it also from a uh, volumetric standpoint. So we're going to be figuring it cubed. So you would be looking at if you're looking at square feet, it's how many square feet do you have that's at least a foot deep or how many acres do you have that's at least four feet deep. And from that, we're going to calculate how much that we would need to put in to effectively cover our pond. Now, once again, down below, we see that if you have got ponds with deep edges, we can get by with a lower dosage fewer parts per million because those deep edges are going to help provide you a little bit more insurance from that light reaching the bottom. Uh, but in many cases, if we're dealing with a shallow pond, we're going to be looking at applying quite a bit more of our aqua shade into that shallow pond because it does not have that insurance policy of deep water. Uh, it doesn't take very much for that sunlight to penetrate down um, if we're only dealing with six inches of water to start with. So that's where it comes in very, very important to always read and follow the label, whether we're using a, a pond dye or any of our herbicides, because it's going to vary from one pond to the next, how much we need to put in there. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is going to be aeration. We talked a moment ago about uh, ponds turning over due to organic matter being decomposed by microbes. Um, Unfortunately, this is a common thing. Um, it happens in our ponds every day and every night. Those microbes are breaking down whatever organic matter is in there. As they do so, they're using up this oxygen. And sooner or later, especially in ponds that tend to be 
overstocked, um, we see these die-offs. And it's a natural occurrence. Um, it's Mother Nature's way basically of hitting the reset button. And in most cases, uh, in 99% of cases, it's not going to kill all of your fish, but it will kill a large portion of them. So aeration is a good way to avoid having these kinds, excuse me, these kinds of rollover events. Oftentimes we see these um, this time of year on these really warm spring days and then it turns off cold at night. What we see happening is um, a lot of your phytoplankton blooms and really does great during the day. And then whenever it gets cold at night, that phytoplankton dies, it starts getting break, broken down overnight. And then at sunrise, your oxygen level is at its lowest point uh, in the oxygen cycle. That's when you're most likely to see fish up at the surface, gasping for air, belly up or, or close to dying. So uh, these, these hot days followed by cool nights and then warm days followed by cold spring rains oftentimes will result in these events. This, these cold rains will have a nice influx of all this cold water with no oxygen in it. And if we remember back in our science classes in school, all of that cold water goes in and it settles at the bottom of the pond, pushes all your oxygenated water up to the top of the pond. And then as that oxygenated water gets pushed towards the top, a lot of the times it's gonna start losing some of its oxygen to the atmosphere. Oftentimes while we'll see uh, steam rolling off of a pond of a morning after a cold rain is some of that stuff is, is being uh, sucked up into the atmosphere. So those are the kind of events where we can oftentimes see a rollover. And so by providing aeration, we can avoid that. This is the kind of aerator that I typically recommend folks to consider. This is referred to as a subsurface aeration unit. Um, you can purchase them online for around $500 up to however much that you want to pay, depending on how fancy that you want to get. Um, usually you can plug these things into your electrical unit at the house. Uh, you can purchase them with, uh, I've seen them with solar panels, uh, but this is something that you would want to run at nighttime whenever you're expecting that oxygen level to, to drop down low. So if you know that we've had a warm day and we're fixing to see an influx of really cold rain for the next several days, or if we've had a whole lot of sunny days and you've got great phytoplankton bloom and then it's fixing to turn off cool and cloudy and you know that phytoplankton is going to die back and those, those microbes are going to break it down, that's when you want to go out there and switch this thing on to make sure that you've got uh, good oxygen in your water column and to keep that water circulating uh, so that those fish don't suffocate. So then we're going to get into supplemental feeding. Um, we're gonna resume feeding your catfish. So if any of y'all are raising catfish in your ponds, uh, really there was no need in feeding them through the winter time. Their metabolic rate slows down when water temperature drops down below 50 degrees. Um, the pond I was in this morning was hitting 59 degrees all over the pond. So um, it's that point in the year where they're, they're breaking that dormancy, they're coming out, they're hungry. Um, it's a good time to be feeding them. So only feed what they're gonna eat within a 10 to 15 minute period. Um, number one, if they're not eating it within 10 to 15 minutes uh, with a floating fish feed, it's going to sink to the bottom and it's going to be useless to you. Number one, you're wasting money. Number two, you're also providing more nutrients into your water column and that can provide a, a problem if we get too many nutrients in there. So uh, make sure you're only feeding what they're going to clean up and uh, don't feed more than 15 pounds per day without aeration. Um, most folks are never going to be feeding quite that much. Um, but uh, if, if we're in a situation where we're really trying to grow quite a few fish in that pond and, and really pushing for growth rates, um, make sure you've got some aeration in there because the more of this you're putting into those fish, the more it's coming out the back end of them. And once again, you're boosting that nutrient load in the pond. And that's also going to cause uh, some issues with, with oxygenation. So having that uh, supplemental aeration in there could save you quite a bit of money and quite a bit of headache as well. And then I just threw this in here for those folks that are raising catfish and that are, that are interested with it. Um, catfish tend to have a fantastic feed conversion ratio. Um, for every 2.5 pounds of feed that you give them, they're gonna gain a pound of meat. Um, of course, efficiency is gonna slow down once those uh, fish get larger. Once they hit seven pounds, their feed efficiency drops considerably. So if you can harvest those catfish out before they hit seven pounds, um, and then restock again, uh, you'll, you'll see some outstanding feed efficiencies in these fish. 
All right, Matt said that we also had a few uh, questions about spring fish stocking. So if you've got a new pond or you've got an old pond that you're looking at, uh, at adding more fish into, right now is a fine time for it. Um, with a bass bluegill pond, that's, that's mostly what I, what I see and work with in this line of work. Um, you're going to want a ratio of 10 to 1 uh, with, these, with these bluegill to largemouth bass, meaning that you want 10 bluegill for every largemouth. That's, that's going to be your minimal ratio. The reason for that is we can only support so many pounds per square acre of, 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 uh, of water, and these bass are going to be relying on these bluegill for feed. Uh, that's the whole point of having the bluegill and shellcracker in with them. Um, for newer unfertilized ponds, um, we're going to be stocking about 500 bluegill per acre uh, and 50 one to three inch bass per acre. And you can do that through the end of June. Uh, you're better off doing it earlier in the spring. Uh, once we get into late summer months, those warm water temperatures can be kind of hazardous on our fish. You can stress them quite a bit going from a cool hatchery to a, to a hot pond. And uh, if you've already got fish existing in the, that pond, as soon as you put them in there, if you stress them, uh, they become an all-you-can-eat buffet to the existing predatory fish that you might already have. Um, you'll see on here I've also got shell cracker. Um, that's going to be your red ear sunfish. These are a very, very beneficial fish to have. Um, the reason they're called shell cracker is because they eat pond snails. And these pond snails, oftentimes they'll get brought into your pond by birds, blue herons, and they are the carriers of a, uh, of a fish parasite known as white grub. So whenever we get a pond that's got a lot of these pond snails in it, we also see quite a bit of white grub parasite. And if you're wanting to keep your fish healthy, and especially if you are consuming these fish, um, it, it's never pleasant to fillet open a, a nice slab bluegill and see these white grub inside of it. Uh, so by putting these red ear sunfish in there, they'll consume those, uh, those pond snails and keep you from having that issue uh, most all the time. Then with catfish, uh, if we're looking at stocking catfish into a pond, um, 50, six to eight inch fish per acre is what you're gonna wanna put in there. I know that seems low, but keep in mind catfish are a predatory fish. If you've got other fish in there, they're gonna be eating a lot of them. Um, and the thing about catfish, we recommend only stocking channel catfish. Um, I don't recommend blue cats or yellow catfish or flatheads. Uh, channel catfish are gonna be what I recommend to stock in a pond. And it's a good and bad thing too with cats. Um, typically your channel catfish are not going to reproduce in a farm pond. Um, these channel catfish are cavity nesters. They prefer to have a cavity that they can get back into to lay their eggs. Um, and whenever you're in a uh, constrained environment like a pond, if you've got bluegill or red ear sunfish present, um, whenever she does find a cavity to put those eggs in, those bluegill and sunfish are going to typically get in there and eat those eggs before they ever have a chance to hatch. Um, so that's, that's just an issue that we get into with uh, channel catfish in ponds. The good thing about it is whenever you put 50 catfish in there, you know how many fish you've got in. And as you catch them out, if you are keeping effective and accurate catch records, then you're gonna be able to keep up with how many fish that you still have stocked in that pond. Um, so I would recommend pulling those fish out before they got above seven pounds um, and then restocking um, once again, if you wanna continue a, uh, a continual catfish pond operation. And then with tilapia, right now uh, is not the time for stocking tilapia. We wanna be stocking these fish whenever water temperatures are consistently in the 60s. As I said today, the water temperature down here at Spring Hill was uh, 59 degrees. So we're not quite to that rate just yet for stocking tilapia. This is something you're probably gonna be looking at stocking in late April to early May if you're interested in these fish. Um, stocking rates for these are gonna range from 50 to 100 pounds per acre. And once again, these fish aren't going to survive through the winter. This is just gonna be a summertime fish. They are tropical. Once temperature drops down below 50 degrees in October, they're gonna to start to flash. And uh, within a few weeks, you'll have uh, dead tilapia as well will occur from that. But they do have their place um, in a fisheries environment. They spawn frequently. They provide quite a bit of feed through the summertime for your, for your predatory fish. And they are herbivores, so a lot of your um, aquatic vegetation, they do a very good job of actually eating it. They don't do much for filamentous algae, but for duckweeds and several of our other uh, aquatic weeds, that's what they primarily feed on. 
Then we get into harvest. Um, this is one that um, if I had a, a stump to stand on and shout, this is the one that I would probably get fired up the most about. Um, most ponds that I look at, whenever we take a shock boat into a pond and we shock it up and we pull a representative sample out of it, most often we find that folks are not harvesting their fish quite enough to keep their ponds in balance. Um, and that's just the most common issue that we get into from a fishery standpoint. Um, the best thing that you can do on a harvest standpoint is to create and keep a record of the fish that you're catching and removing from your pond. And then by keeping up with these records, um, we can see what that pond is doing over a long-term basis. So we wanna record the species. What species are we catching? What is the length of that species? What is the overall weight? And what is the date that you're catching it? And then did we catch, did we keep that species or did we release it back into the pond? So with bass, we want to return all of your bass that are less than 15 inches during the first year. If you just stocked your pond, it's brand new, turn all those bass back in there, it's new. We don't wanna be pulling too many of them out on the front end. Um, from the fourth year on, however, we're going to be removing uh, 25, 8 to 12 inches and then returning those 12 to 15. Those, those 12 to 15 inch fish, they're going to be reproducing and, and providing you with uh, reproductive benefits. Uh, but we want to remove several of those smaller fish to keep it from getting overpopulated. Um, and then we want to return those bass that are over 15 inches um, in most cases. Uh, the key here is that the key take home message in a bass pond is that we want to remove 20 to 25 pounds of bass per acre per year to prevent overpopulation. So whenever we think about that, that can actually turn out to be quite a few fish that we are taking out of that pond. But if we don't take them out of that pond, what we'll see every single time without fail is overpopulation of these fish. Um, that female is going to spawn once, maybe in some cases twice a year, and she's going to be laying several thousand eggs each time that she spawns. And it does not take very long to get a heavy population on these bass. And once you have a heavy population of bass, they are really going to wipe out your, your prey species and put your pond in a state of unbalance. So um, I've got a seven acre pond in my backyard. I've got bass bluegill out there. Um, haven't had time to fish it as much as I would like to, but if I were managing it properly, I would be pulling 140 pounds of bass out of that pond every year and having a fish fry with them. So um, just something to keep in mind. Whenever we get to studying these fish, we mentioned a moment, a moment ago about uh, keeping good catch records. Um, these catch records, by keeping up with the, the length of the fish, the weight, and then the date that you're catching it, um, if you get that information to someone like myself or your Middle Tennessee fisheries guy, Craig Kimbrough, um, he can look at those, those lengths and weights and dates, and we can formulate what's called relative weight to see if your fish are matching up to where they should be. So what relative weight is, it's a ratio of actual weight of the fish that you caught out of your pond compared to what a rapidly growing healthy fish of the same length should be. Uh, and we call that the standard weight. So to calculate that, we take the fish that you're catching out of your pond, the actual weight, and then we divide that by the standard weight uh, to get that, that relative weight ratio. And so this is what the relative weight chart looks like. It's, it actually goes all the way down to, I think, 24 inch long bass, but I didn't have enough space on the screen to show that. But um, what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be comparing the length of that fish versus the standard weight. So if I'm catching a 12, uh, a 12 inch bass out of my pond in the backyard and I know that that bass is one pound, we know that it's a healthy fish, it's above standard weight. Um, but if I'm catching that 12 incher and it's only registering at uh, seven tenths of a pound, we know that we might have a problem. And by compiling that from several different fish, uh, both largemouth bass and bluegill, we can compare those weights to know to, to get some idea what might be the issue in your pond. So if we've got high relative weight on bass, but low relative weight on bluegill, uh, then we can assume that we're probably brim crowded. We've got too many bluegill. We might have competing forage like shiners or bullhead. And we may need to go in there and really just go to war on catching some of those, those brim out of that pond to get it back into balance. Whereas if we've got uh, 
really low bass weights, but uh, high bluegill weights, we can assume that we're probably bass crowded. We've got way too many largemouth bass in there. Uh, we might have catfish or, or, or crappie in there as well that, uh, that, are, that are competing and, and causing, your, uh, causing your, your bass population to be uh, out of balance on their relative weights. So, so our ideal situation is to have really high weights on our bass and really high weights on our bluegill as well. And at that point, we know that we've got our pond balanced. So continue harvesting. Um, this can prevent all kinds of problems that we get into. Um, if we're harvesting properly, we're less likely to have stunted fish. Um, we're less likely to have a rollover. Um, if, we've got, uh, if we've got too many fish in a pond and we're overstocked, typically you're gonna see that pond be a lot muddier because it's crowded. They're having to uh, fight through and they're stirring up sediment and it's, it's causing turbidity. Um, but once we lose balance in a pond, it can be really difficult to get that balance back in there. And in some cases, uh, the best thing that we can do in a pond that's really out of whack uh, is to do a full renovation on it, which would be to rote on it. Um, and and rote known is something that we prefer to stay away from if, if we can, uh, because that's gonna kill every fish in there. We're gonna take out everything, kill it all, and then restock and start from square one again. So. Uh, your favorite seasonings and hot grease, that is a good management tool uh, for making sure that we don't get these ponds overpopulated. So with that, uh, let's see, looks like we got through that in about uh, 35 minutes. We've got time for questions. Um, if anybody has got them, I would be uh, more than happy to try and answer some questions at this time. If I can get my computer to work right. All right. Thank you, Justin. If anybody has a question for Justin, you can unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat box. Hey, Justin, it's Ransom. Uh, the other day you were talking about a more hybrid bluegill that doesn't uh, um, uh, I guess breed as quick. It doesn't what is what was the name of that, that hybrid fish you're talking about? The hybrid brim, right? With our with our hybrid bluegills, um, oftentimes it's just referred to as a hybrid bluegill. Some will call it a copper nosed bluegill. Um, they do grow quicker. What it is, it's a hybrid between your northern bluegill and green sunfish. Um, they grow really quick. Um, they can get up to two pounds uh, fairly easily and fairly quickly. They put up an excellent fight. But I will throw in a little bit of caution on hybridized bluegill. They do fantastic if you're just managing a pond for bluegill. If you've got a pond that you're only wanting to catch bluegill out of, that's great. But if you are using them as a supplemental forage species for largemouth bass, it does tend to be a little bit of a problem. Um, and the problem is that uh, these hybrid bluegill, because they grow really quickly, they will grow faster and larger than a bass can eat um, pretty quick. Um, typically, most of your bass, they're going to be eating bluegill seven inches and smaller. Well, if this fish goes up to eight inches real quick, that's a problem for a bass that's hungry. He may not be able to eat that fish. And at that point, it's just taking up space. The other thing about the hybridized bluegill, sometimes folks will tell you that they will not reproduce in a pond. They will not reproduce with other hybridized bluegill. If you have existing northern bluegill, or green ear sunfish, they will reproduce with either one of those, but they will reproduce at greatly reduced rates. So instead of that female laying 10,000 eggs each time that she spawns, she might lay only 500 eggs. And at that point, you're once again, reducing your overall forage in that pond. So good question, Ransom, I appreciate that. And another, while I'm on that soapbox about uh, fish that can be problematic in a pond. I get a lot of calls from folks wanting to put uh, crappie in ponds. And I live on Kentucky Lake. Folks love crappie fishing down there. Before that, I was on Real Foot Lake and we did a lot of crappie fishing up there too. I understand they are delicious. They're a lot of fun to catch. They do not do well in a pond. Um, the problem with crappie is they reproduce so quickly and they're such aggressive predators that 
if it is a small pond, they will completely devastate your forage fish population. And then they're gonna start eating each other and you'll wind up with a pond chock full of stunted crappie. Um, typically, I don't recommend stocking crappie in a pond any less than 20 acres, um, just because they are such voracious predators and because they reproduce so quickly. They'll, they'll, they'll clean out your forage fish population. Any other questions? So Justin, this is Kevin in Giles County. Um, I do get some calls from time to time on uh, leaks. And mm -hmm. I know we need to be referring folks sometimes to, to uh, some engineers and so forth on pond design and set up and that type of thing. Who, who, are, who are you recommending that we, or are there some sources out there to utilize or send people to? There are some sources. Um, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the sources down your way around Giles County. Craig Kimbrough might be a good one to, to speak with on that. And uh, at this time, we don't really have a formalized list of, of engineers that we can refer folks to. And that's something that, uh, that I would like to compile on. Uh, in fact, I was up meeting with Ransom just a short while back dealing with some pond leaks. And that is becoming more and more of a problem as some of these ponds get older. Um, and, and a lot of that is a result of uh, not pointing any fingers at anyone, but a lot of that is a result of neglect sometimes on part of the owner. Um, some of these ponds, whenever we allow trees to grow up on these levees, um, those roots are, they're, they're compromising the structural integrity of that levee. So if you have trees growing on your levee, try to, Try to keep them trimmed back before they can become a problem. Um, once they get to the, the size of your leg, they've already got sizable enough roots that they can create a pretty, pretty good sized hole through that levee. Um, so if you can keep those trees trimmed off the levees, that helps out quite a bit. Now, as far as water percolating through the levee, that's oftentimes a result of uh, poor initial design. And at that point, at that point, repair gets to be very, very expensive very problematic and there are no guarantees as to whether or not that repair will actually work. Uh, so, so you're right, Kevin, uh, we need to get y'all a list of uh, engineers in your area that, that you can refer folks to on something like that. Well, do you, do you recommend Benton night? I mean, a lot of folks, they'll come in and they'll, they may have an area that's leaking and they may or may not have it identified. Right. I know that's one thing they can try without going to, you know, maybe an engineer or somebody. Most time, I guess you get an engineer involved, you're going to have some pretty, uh, I mean, a pretty big job and maybe quite a bit of money invested to fix that. So what's your thoughts on maybe using that bentonite clay? Bentonite is something that I recommend. Uh, that's, that's probably one of our best and most affordable tools. It's not cheap by any means, but it's one of the more affordable tools that we have at our disposal for, uh, for solving some of these pond leaks. Um, if you know exactly where the leak is at, you can, you can put that bitten out over that. What we recommend is trying to drain that pond down below the leak. And then if you can figure out where that leak is, if it's percolating through a particular area, go in there and, and put that bitten out down and work it into the existing soil before raising the water level back up. Now, let's say that you've got a pond that has got a leak in it and it's the result of a muskrat hole and it is a defined hole in the side of the levee. Um, in that case, you're going to be taking that benton knot and, and trying to pack that hole to the best of your ability and then pack around that hole or about, I would say in most cases, probably three feet around that hole. You're going to be trying to pack that benton knot in so that it kind of holds itself in there like, like a nail head. Um, but there's still no guarantee with that. The, the problem with leaky ponds, we can throw the best technology and the best money in the world at it. And at the end of the day, if Mother Nature doesn't like it, it's not going to work out for us. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. I have a problem with water meal mm -hmm. uh, for the last three years on our pond on the surface. Yes, uh, what are your thoughts about trying to get rid of that? What works? I've tried some chemical that wasn't very effective. Right. Which, uh, do you mind me asking which chemical that you attempted? I, I'm thinking it was sonar off the top of my head is what I tried. Yes. 
Gotcha. Uh, unfortunately, sonar is one of our more effective ones on water meal. Um, and and I've, I've got a pond that I work with frequently that has got an issue with duckweed. The two are very similar. And uh, those are, they're, they're difficult to control. Um, carp will eat some water meal, uh, not a great deal of it. Um, but your, your flamoxazin based herbicides, sonar, avast, those those tend to do quite well. And then Clipper. Clipper is probably the best one that we've got in the toolbox on, on water meal and duckweed. Okay. Would it be advantageous if I could maneuver it to put a spillway? My pond doesn't have one. It usually doesn't overflow at all. But if somehow mm -hmm. we're able to put a spillway in, would that uh, drain off? You know, when the water level got up, would that drain that? Uh, floating uh, water meal off? It would reduce, it, it would in all likelihood reduce some of the biomass uh, that you're dealing with there. Uh, it's not going to solve your issue, um, but it would likely reduce um, some of the biomass that you're dealing with. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, hey just this Kevin again. I've got that very problem the gentleman just asked and and mm -hmm. i've got a constant flow in and out on mine and and that stuff will stay around it'll move some right especially if we get a heavy rain mm -hmm. uh, and you get a little flood and it'll wash some of it out but it it typically it stand sticks pretty good you know uh staying there one thing a surfactant uh might help to make sure that when you use these products that they are making good co contact with your weeds you're trying to control. Yes, and thank you for bringing that up, Kevin. I'm, I'm sorry that I've neglected to mention that, but uh, aquatic surfactant does make a big difference on how well that that, that, that chemical actually sticks with that. Because if, if you think about it, you're, whenever you're spraying that stuff, you're spraying quite a bit of uh, chemical that's already been somewhat diluted into a pond and some of it will get diluted further and if it does not stick to the the water meal or the duckweed that we're trying to kill then that will reduce the efficiency of it um, but uh, if, if you've tried sonar in the past i would i would maybe consider looking at uh, a chemical similar to clipper that's using uh, flamoxazin as a, as a primary mode of action All right, excellent questions and comments. Justin, you have, there's one here that sent me a question in the chat box that says, what about parrot's feather infestation? Parrot's feather infestation, um, on something like that, uh, unfortunately I've not dealt with it all that much in West Tennessee. I would have to look that one up. Uh, I'm familiar with parrot's feather I've just not had to recommend any treatments on it uh, in West Tennessee uh, in the past year or so. But uh, I can, if you can get his contact information, I'd be happy to look it up and uh, get that information to them. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there any other questions for Justin? Well, Justin, thank you for the fine job that you did for us today. Yes, sir. And